I'm Einstein Milan. I'm a software architect here at WhiteProt, and today I'll be discussing embeddings and large language models. First, I want to highlight our effort internally, which is to have a space for everyone to share uh, information and things that you have, may have looked into. This is what the OTT is, and just hope that everybody is willing to participate at some point. And uh, if you haven't done so already, hit that like and subscribe button and uh, take a look at our videos. Brief recap on what large language models are and large language models such as the GPT model developed by OpenAI are a type of machine learning model designed to generate human-like text. These models are trained on a vast amount of data and the ability to generate coherent and textually relevant sentences. They, work by, they usually work of uh, something called completions and it's basically being able to predict the next word in a sentence, given all the previous all the previous words. The reason these models are called large is because they have an enormous number, number of parameters, which is essentially the factors that the model considers when making predictions. The size of these models allow them to capture a wide array of information and nuances and details about the language, enabling, to, enabling them to form tasks in a, in a efficient manner such as translation, question answering, summarization, and even writing essays and poems. I always like to make the comparison between uh, the nearest neighbors models, such as the old Google Translator model and the new GPT models. The new GPT models, just by interacting with them, you can tell there's a, there's a order of magnitude difference in the way that they understand context and put sentences together. And then uh, this leads us to the subject matter of this talk, which is we all know, or at least uh, th those of us that have, have interacted with the GPT, the chat GPT and the GPT models, we're aware that the models were trained until uh, the year 2021. I think it was September 2021. And this is useful to a certain extent, but not too useful when you want to uh, build your own models and work with information, perhaps in a private manner, in a private manner, or with only information that you've fed your system. And I'll give an example of this. At the end of this talk, I'll have a brief demo of, of how we interact with long language models with embeddings. Vector embeddings are a mathematical representation of the data. And if any of you have done linear algebra before, you'll notice that a vector is just a one-dimensional matrix, pretty much. And uh, what these vectors are, they're a representation, a mathematical representation of a corpus of text or a piece of text. Typically, we refer to words, sentences, or even larger, larger pieces. These embeddings are generated in such a way that the geometric space that they inhabit captures the semantic relationships between words or sentences. For instance, words with similar meanings tend to have similar vector embeddings. And these embeddings can capture analogies, synonyms, and other linguistic relationships. Vector embeddings are also crucial for large language models because they condense the vast majority of complexity of language into a more manageable form. They allow efficient computations and enable the model to understand nuanced semantic relationships. That means that if you can convert a question that you ask a model to a vector and you, can, and you already have information in a vector database, for example, PG vector with these vectors, you can do similarity searches and it can help you basically talk to information via chat models. It's really interesting if you think about the possibilities of the things that we can do with these. How do we integrate these? We integrate them with large language models. We, as, I, as I mentioned, we give them a nuanced understanding of the text data before that, that they're trained on. And the model learns not, not just to predict the, the next word in a sentence, but also to understand relationships between different words and the nuanced meanings of sentences. The vector embeddings provide a way to map high dimensional data, which is text, into a lower dimensional space, which helps making the computations more efficient. This mapping also preserves semantic relationships between the words of sentences, allowing the model to understand the context of the text that it's generating or interpreting. By combining these two technologies, we can create more powerful, accurate, and efficient language models. For example, in sentiment analysis, this approach can lead to more accurate determinations of sentiment, even in complex sentences. 
in content generation, it can result in even more relevant and contextually appropriate content. In chatbots, it can lead to more accurate responses with, large, um, uh, with that better understand the user's intent. Overall, the integration vector embeddings with large language models can significantly enhance the power and utility of these models in a wide range of applications. Let's explore a few of the use cases of how this approach can be beneficial for different use cases, such as personalized content generation, sentiment analysis, chatbots, et cetera. For personal content generation, take for example, a blogging platform, we could use this to generate content tailored to a spe specific, to user specific preferences by feeding them user data, like past reading history, interactions, or even written reviews into a model. The system can generate vector embeddings for that user, capturing their unique interests and preferences. This allows the language model to generate content that align, aligns to the, with these preferences by providing personalized reading experience to each user. And there I can think of many other cases. For example, imagine that you were ordering food from a restaurant from a chatbot and the chatbot has an understanding of your allergies, has an understanding of your, of your, of your preferences. Say, for example, you like your burger with no lettuce and no cheese. The chatbot can certainly remember these things and have a memory reaching them as far back as we we like we would like for it. If you want to discuss with a chatbot what you ordered about 10 days ago or 30 minutes ago, it can derive content from that and context. If you want to make documentation for a client and you fed it, you fed the model enough, enough examples of the content you generate for clients after say a meeting, you can automate these things, proofreading, but you can automate them, save you a lot of time and it gives you the, gives you a, the ability to focus on, on other critical tasks. Sentiment analysis, uh, understanding the nuances of language can make a significant difference. And uh, you know what I like, what, what I envision, imagine you have a meeting, I think some platforms already do these things where you can have a transcript of the meeting. And then with that transcript, you can determine the mood of the meeting or the mood of, of a specific person. Determine if the individual is stressed out or if the individual needs uh, something in particular that may have missed, have, have been missed during the meeting. If we, we sit down and start thinking about the possibilities, this is uncharted territory. It's a hot topic. Information retrieval. So this links back to the what I mentioned with respect to meetings. It can re retrieve information specific to a, to a domain or to any applications that we determine, determine importance. For example, search engines of recommendation systems can also benefit from this integration. For example, when a user searches for thriller movies with a twist ending, a system using this approach could better understand the user's specific intent. It would map this query into the embedding space and retrieve movies closely aligned with these criteria. If we had a transcript of the movie and the model had, a, had access to the transcript of the movie, not only could, could we generate movie uh, scripts, but we could also find with a more higher precision and accuracy movies that are closer to our tastes and preferences. Automated moderation, everyone's heard that bleep or perhaps trolling on the web. I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad, bad thing. We have two sides of the scale when you have moderation versus freedom of expression. I don't want to delve into the politics, but this is certainly, certainly something that can be leveraged to that intent. Now for a demo. I did something very basic. I took a uh, Star Wars game, role-playing game PDF book. I ingested it into a PG vector database, which is a Postgres database. I'll show you what these vectors look like. And um, then I will have, I will demonstrate how the large language model talks to the book and we can ask questions. And then I'll, I'll demo how we can limit the knowledge only to the book or work with aggregated knowledge from the model training plus the book or plus the instructions. Like a cooking show, I've already ingested the, the book and I'll show you in the database what it looks like. Let me know if everyone can see it. Everyone's been very quiet. I see some reactions from the microphones, so you can hear me. We have collections. This is a, there's an extension called PG Vector that we use to give Postgres the ability to work with vectors. There are many library extensions, but this is one of them. And uh, we're using a 
a GitHub repository or library called LangChain, which helps us build applications uh, around large language models and chat models. We've made, a, I made, I have a few collections. One is Star Wars. The other is not relevant for the purposes of this talk. And then we have the embeddings. And here's what the vectors look like. Here's the collection ID that points back this table, just a UUID. And here are the embeddings. As you can see, these are just vectors. It's a one dimensional matrix that has uh, weights and values that encompass context based on the corpus of text that was embedded into this database, or that was ingested into this database. Very lengthy, a very lengthy vector. But we also say the content that corresponds to this vector. What I did was chunk it, chunk it since the large language models that we use, I used OpenAI in this case, the Da Vinci, I used the Da Vinci model, if I'm not mistaken. It has a token limit. And for those of you that don't know, tokens is just a way that the computer, a way that the computer sanitizes a corpus of text and makes it into digestible pieces that can later be converted into vectors. I keep going to the right. And then we have uh, other metadata about the data or other data about the data, metadata. And uh, it tells you the source where the file was ingested from. Here's a PDF, Old Republic Lore PDF. And without further ado, I have already fired up my little panel that uh, one of my, I don't know if you're here, Matias was kind enough to share with me so I could have this in the UI. And the first thing that I've done, look a little bit of code is, I'm working only with a, with a language model. If you see over here, we have chat open AI and we have open AI. Open AI refers to just the language model. Chat open AI refers to the chat model. There's a distinction between the chat model and the language model. And uh, there are a few distinctions. Uh, one of them is the chat model works with what's, it works with completions, prompts and inputs that it's been trained on with information from the internet. And it, it works in many ways, such as question answering and whatnot. The language model, by contrast, it only, it, it works in several ways, but mainly it does similarity searches between models with a little bit of added chat intelligence, but not too much. Nevertheless, there, we can, there are parameters that we can pass into this very useful class, such as temperature and the specific model that we want to use, but that's out of the scope of this meeting. I'm working with language models. I want to, I want to make sure that it's only limited to what I've embedded. If I were to ask anything off topic, it should just say, I don't know. Let me ask the question that I always ask. Who is Albert Einstein? It doesn't, it doesn't know who Albert Einstein is, but if I were to ask it, who are Sim? Remember we ingested a Star Wars book. There's an answer. And that this is all in the, in the PDF. In fact, let me see if I can pull it up just so we have a bit more context. I might be in the wrong window. Everyone can still see my screen, right? Yes, we can. So this is this is the, the book that I ingested. It parsed everything in here, it tokenized it. And this is what I'm talking to. So I can ask it, for example, what Tython is. It says Tython is the birthplace of the Jedi Order and is a planet located deep in the deep core region of the galaxy. This is from the Star Wars work. Now I'm gonna go ahead and switch back, switch back to the chat model and you'll notice the difference. It will answer a few questions it was not able to answer before. And that is because it is working not only with the embeddings, but it is also working with the chat, uh, the training, training data used in making the chat model itself. Let me reload this. Refresh the window. Here it is. So I can say, who is Albert Einstein? And it will, it will give me a nice answer. By the way, uh, I'm working with a GPT-4 model. I feel betrayed. Let's see, chat, AI. Come on, don't make me look bad. I tested this before. It should work. It should work. And with free toolbox? What's that? And if you change it to the D3 toolbox? It might, it might work. I'm going to try that in a bit. Yep. Let's switch back to 3 GPT, GPT-4 turbo. Yeah. Third time's a charm. Who is George Washington? I'm going to cheat. Oops. If you ask about the Jedi content. I'll ask. It's, yeah, it knows who George Washington is. Who was Albert Einstein? And I'll ask about the Jedi Order. But it may give me something from the model. Here it is. Thank you for that one. Maybe I'm not ready to use the GPT-4 model. 
what is uh, let me ask you um since this model I, do you know uh, how many languages was uh, trained in this model it will this all this flow will work on as well with spanish right depends on yes. the and i can test it with jedi order let me test that with the jedi order also that's a good question right because you ingest like the jedi content in english this the model yeah. will be able to ask for in spanish right let's see should be <laughs> i hope so right? it's curious that great when these models uh, because this, this model has like the features sometimes they are i saw that some of those models are were were trained with with our language like japanese or chinese and so on so that is like a all that well look okay. they're amazing and it says hello trooper and uh, that is oh, because i because I, I i prompted i told it i told it that it let me see if i can find that prompt it should be right here maybe it's possible to ask to make no sense but we can ask to give the response in french for example right as well yes by the way, this this has Breedis memory. I don't know about the response. Say what about I could ask it in French. Uh, security measure. Yep. I always get that. Right now we are using like free uh, free turbo, right? What's that? And uh, we are using like the model uh, free free dot five turbo model, not the four, right? T four. We're using GPT three point five turbo. Something was up with the GPT four, but but I think I this is this is my theory. I prompt it, I prompt the chat model to say, I don't know when it doesn't know anything, but it doesn't obey my prompt. The GPT 3.5 model doesn't obey that. But when I switched to four, it said, I don't know. So maybe the GPT four model, I have to experiment with it a little bit. My theory is that it's obeying the prompt better than the 3.5 model. That is my theory, but I have to experiment with it. Any questions so far? That's that's all I have. Let's say that you want to feed the the model with something different than text maybe like json something that you got from a, maybe a web scraping or something like it how do you provide context for object keys for example or how would that work or I would line chain handle that as well line chain has a concept there's many approaches line chain has the concept of agents and the language models are smart enough there's something called React for large language models, and it is a, a way for, let me go back a little bit, agents give the language models the ability to use tools. There is a tool for math, there is a tool for JSONs, and we can make custom tools as well. And the way the language model knows how to use these tools is with a, with a reasoning architecture or framework called React. And I'm not referring to the front-end application, uh, to the front-end development library. I'm talking about the React model. And what you do is you, you give it a scratch pad and the model as it, if you're prompting it correctly, will ask the questions and will know how to, when to use the tools. If you provided a tool mm -hmm. to act with JSONs, it will know how to, what to do when it finds a JSON with that agent. Let me see if I can find it here. Let's go to the Python docs. And we have agents. See, it talks about it is the idea of agents is to use a large language model to choose a sequence of actions to take. You give it access to tools and toolkits. And through the reasoning, it will say, look, I need to use a, an API endpoint, or I need to use a mathematical tool, or I need to use, I need to, I need to read a JSON. I need to parse the JSON. That, that's one way. Another way, something that I've done is I take that JSON and I make it into text prompt information. You can actually ask ChatGPT. You can say, look, you stringify the JSON or you paste the JSON and say, I want you to generate a prompt with this JSON. In the case, for example, if you have a menu, menus have items, right? You can have beverages, blah, 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 whatever. You would have it, you create a list in, in text of the item, the description, and price. And you, if any of you have used Django templating, you can inject that as part of the corpus of text for the prompt. 
and the model is smart enough to understand what's, what information is in there. So the, this lang chain gives us the ability to, to do templating and inject information into, into the conversation, memory, context, anything you want, any, any variable you believe is useful, as well as using tools such as for JSON parsing, translation, mathematical, et cetera, J API usage for third parties. It's a very young technology, but it can certainly be done. Right. It's smart enough to, let's say, you store different products and the prices will be closer, uh, con contextually closer when you embed them in the, in the vector database, right? Yes. Yes. You will have it. You can have information. You can you use the vector database to give it more information additional to what it has from ChatGPT, for example. And you can use these agents to help you interact in ways outside of just text processing. You can have it total orders for you. You can, you can have it call an API endpoint for you. You can add custom tools, such as the one I'm showing here in the example, which is to get the length of a word. Although ChatGPT can do this already, it's smart enough to do it. This is just a sort of hello world example, letting you know, letting you know what the possibilities of what you can do with these tools and agents. Right. Any more questions, anybody? Well, in that case, I will give you back your time. I wish everybody a wonderful weekend. Thank you for attending. Thank you.